What's going on, my friends? This is Dustin Stelzer with another episode of Electrician U. And today we're going to talk about resistance and impedance, or ohms. So, resistance. Um, the difference between resistance and impedance really is one is talking about AC and one is talking about DC. So with impedance you're talking about AC electricity and with resistance you're talking about DC. So what is resistance? I'm just going to use the word resistance for a while before I start getting into the difficulty behind impedance. Resistance literally means like resisting something. It's uh, opposing something. So with, uh, with electric current, when something has resistance, it means that it's opposing the flow of current. Um, so quite literally how we use electricity, how electricity works, is there has to be a load in the circuit. If you were just to take a hot wire and a neutral wire and you were going to touch them together, it's going to blow up or it's going to start melting the insulation off the wire and making the wire glow red hot because there's so much current flowing through. Anytime that you have a source of electricity and you connect the two terminals of that source, you're going to send so many damn electrons through at one time that it's going to get really hot and it's unstable, it's very dangerous. So it's our job as electricians to slow electricity down and we do that with resistance. So resistance can be thought of as a load. So when we have a resistance, really what we're talking about is like a coil of wire. Let's just say that if we were to hook a hot up to this side and a neutral up to this side. Current would flow through this thing, but since it has to flow through a spiral, it's that spiral of wire is slowing the current down. And how that works is, like we have a coil of wire here. It's just a, a, a wire with two ends, one end here, one end here. Well, when you send current, when you send current from one side of this coil to the other side of this coil. Inside of here, it creates a really strong magnetic field. It creates a magnetic field all around the wire, but since all of the wire's magnetic fields meet on the inside, it really condenses that magnetic field. So like if I were to draw this thing, you've got all these magnetic domains that go around the wire. You know, as it's... Uh, as current's flowing through this, it's creating uh, a magnetic field around this wire. Well, since the wire is in a spiral shape, you actually have magnetic domains that go all the way around. These are called flux lines or lines of flux. So if you see what happens in here, say this is the coil, on the inside it's really, really, really tight. So that is a way that we can resist electricity. There's a, uh, it makes it more difficult to get through, so it slows current down. So with DC electricity, we call this phenomenon resistance. Um, resistance is a physical phenomenon, so when you send current, a steady flow of current in one direction, which is what DC is, when you send that steady flow of current, through a spiral shape, which we also call a coil, it's slowing electricity down. So it's creating enough resistance that current has to slow down. And current and resistance have an a, um, inversely proportional relationship. When you raise current, you lower resistance. When you raise uh, resistance, you lower current. Um, there's really no way in an electrical circuit that we can change amperage. There's no, you know, like voltage, you can change if you're plugged into a 
120 volt socket or you can change if you're plugged into a 240 volt circuit. You can actually change voltage. You can get a transformer, go down to 12 volts. It's an element in the circuit that can be changed. Well, the only other thing in a circuit that can be changed is the resistance. You can change what kind of load you're using. You can have a motor, you can have a, um, a heating element, or you can put two heating elements together to gain more resistance. So there's only those two elements that are really even in an electrical circuit. That's what electrical circuits are made up of. They're made of voltage and resistance. And even the wires that we send current through have a certain amount of resistance. Now it's usually pretty negligible depending on what the size of the wire is and the amount of current you're trying to jam down that wire's throat. But in most cases we don't really consider the resistance of the wire because we properly size the wires that we're supposed to be sending to these loads. So let's talk about some loads for a second that um, have resistance. So inside of a uh, a light bulb. We've got an incandescent light bulb, right? Um, incandescent light bulb kind of looks like this. It's got the spirally little screw shell and it's got a little piece of metal on the bottom. With inside there's this tiny little element that's basically a coil of wire. It's a really really finely tight bound coil of wire. So what you're doing is you're running a hot to the bottom of this bulb. You're running a neutral to the shell of the bulb. So current is literally going in through this filament, being slowed down all the way through that element, and then it's touching the screw shell and it's going back to the source. So you know, from your panel, you're gonna send a hot and a neutral out, and you're basically, instead of touching that hot and the neutral together, you're touching them to a light bulb, to a load. And you notice when you hook it up to a light bulb, nothing bad happens, the light just lights up. Well, the light bulb lighting up is a wanted effect of sending a bunch of current through a really tiny wire that's wound up in a coil. So we use resistors for really, uh, to do work for us, for conveniences really. When we want something to glow red hot, you know, like in a toaster, that's another thing. Toasters have these little elements. There's an element inside that's just wound back and forth and it's actually coils of wire. Maybe that's how I should have drawn that. But it's like a coil that goes all the way through the thing. And there's several coils, it's not just one. But when we send a hot and a neutral through that coil, it glows red hot. It's made of a, a, a type of material that is meant to be, uh, to be heated up without like burning up. It's what we would call a high resistance circuit. We're intentionally putting a whole shitload of resistance in this circuit with the hopes that it'll heat up a whole bunch and do something with that heat so that we can use that heat. Furnaces operate the same way. There's little elements inside of furnaces then toaster ovens. They all work off the idea of we're trying to cram a bunch of current through a high, high resistance, a wrapped up coil that we have to slow current down through. And then we're just using the byproduct, which is the heat that's created from that. So let's talk about an environment in which you would want low resistance. So uh, rather than trying to get something to glow red hot, we don't want this to glow red hot. And a good example of that would be in the, uh, the ground wire, which we electricians out in the field call it a ground wire. In code, it's called the equipment grounding uh, conductor. So the equipment grounding conductor that we run to a piece of equipment, it never has any current on it. A lot of people are like, why do we run a ground? We have a hot and a neutral. Isn't the ground just like a spare neutral? Kind of, but no. You don't want to think on that terms because if you think, well, it's just kind of a backup neutral, then you're going to think, well, current can flow on it all the time. If the neutral fails, we want to be able to still run this load with our backup neutral. So that's not the way you want to think about it. That's actually incorrect. But it does operate like a neutral. So if you have a ground fault, really, um, here, let me draw a panel. Say we got a panel and we have our L1 and our L2. These are our two hots. There's 240 volts between them. And they go to all these little breakers that are in here. And then we've got our neutral. Our neutral comes in to its own little neutral bus. And then we have a ground bus here. So two hots, neutral, and a ground. Now say we have a washing machine. And 
it's a front load washing machine because we're fancy rich people and we can afford nice things, right? <laughs> Not in this house. Okay, so the washing machine, what we do is we run from one of these breakers, we'll run a hot, I'll just do it from here so it makes like the diagram easier. We're running a hot over to this um, motor and the motor is the load. We'll put a little AC symbol. So we run a hot to one side of our motor. We run our neutral to the other side of the motor. And then we run an equipment grounding conductor or a trade, a trade term ground. We run a ground to the casing, to the metal casing of this whole uh, appliance. The reason that we do that is because when heat gets built up in appliances, when you cram a whole bunch of current through a resistance, sometimes that resistance over a long enough time weakens the metal and the metal fails and it'll break. So worst case scenario, this wash machine, this hot could heat up so much that it actually breaks and it f the wire could flop off and like hit the case. So this now this whole metal appliance is hot. It has potential on it. So if someone were to walk up and they're barefoot in their garage on some concrete floor and they touch that the metal of the washing machine, they're going to get the shit knocked out of them. So we want this ground to basically clear uh, the circuit. We want it to turn off the breaker. Well, the, the reason that this ground will turn off the breaker is because we bond at the service, we bond the ground and the neutral together. That's the reason that we do that. It's to, to safely return any ground fault current, any current that would hit a metal piece of equipment. It needs to go back to the neutral and back out to the source so it can create enough current to trip a breaker. That's how equipment grounds work. So let me break that down a little bit. Remember from our prior videos where we talk about uh, current, and when you touch a hot and a neutral wire together, you're sending a whole shitload of current through. And so if a, if a short like that, that's actually called a short circuit. We're, we're connecting the circuit prior to the load, so it's not going to get slowed down by anything. It's just going to go ramped up, fly through the circuit. We're creating a short. Well, when we have breakers in here and a short happens, so much current flows through that breaker that it sucks the magnet apart that holds that breaker together and it trips that breaker because a lot of current's going through it. So a ground needs to be able to do the same thing, but it, m the majority of the time it's not going to have any current on it because all it's doing is just touching metal parts. But if a metal part becomes energized, it also has to touch that neutral so it can be a completed circuit all the way back up to the transformer and it'll still trip the breaker because current will be going from the breaker all the way through the metal and back up and it'll instantaneously trip it. So if you're talking about that metal appliance being energized for like a split fraction of a second. But the problem becomes if you have too much resistance built up. If this metal part is made of a different kind of material as the wire that's running over to the panel and the bus bar, the ground bus bar is a different kind of metal, and then you got a different kind of metal that's going from the neutral to the ground. You know, if you have too many different kinds of metal, or if the distance is too far, or the conductors are too small, you're going to create way too much resistance on the circuit, and instead of, um, instead of the, the ground being a quick method for the circuit to trip, it's going to act like a load. It's going to build up a lot of resistance. So. We always, always, always want a low impedance path to ground or a low resistance. It's the opposite of a toaster. We don't want that fucking wire glowing red hot and staying hot. We want that breaker to trip. So let's talk about let's talk about the relationship between uh, current and resistance and voltage. So Ohm's law, I'm going to go much more into depth into Ohm's law at a later date, but I just want to show you that there's a relationship to be had um, through Ohm's law. So let's say as we increase resistance, amperage is always going to decrease. Um, 
I'm gonna, instead of calling that A, I'm gonna try to keep some continuity and call that I. If you ever look at the, uh, the Ohm's Law wheel, it looks like this. You have uh, E equals I times R. Now, the reason that this wheel is represented the way it is is because it helps you figure out formulas very quickly so you, you can figure out the relationships between these things. So uh, if we ever wanted to solve for I, we would just cover I up, and this is E divided by R. If we ever wanted to calculate resistance, we'd cover the, the R up, and it would be R equals E over I. Or if we ever wanted to figure out voltage, we could figure out amperage times resistance. That's how that wheel works. So say that we have a given voltage. We'll say 120 volts, and that's a pretty constant uh, value. Well, as you increase resistance in a circuit, you're going to decrease the current. Obviously, you're building up more things in front of that current to try to push through. So it's going to slow it down. There's going to be less current the more resistance that we have. Um, also inversely, you know, the, once you start lowering resistance, it's going to allow current to pass through it more. So again, when we want a breaker to trip, we want that ground to have as little resistance on it as possible. If it builds up a whole bunch of resistance trying to get all the way through the house and through all this crazy wiring and stuff that we, it, that we you know, did incorrectly or poorly, it's going to act like a load, and instead of tripping the breaker, all the metal is still going to stay hot in the house. So you start touching fucking sinks and metal water pipes and all kinds of stuff. All that stuff's bonded together. It should be for code. So that's the reason why, again, that we would want a low impedance path. Um, but that also explains toasters. You know, you put a whole shitload of resistance, all those little elements inside of it, and you're not going to be able to run very much current through it. So instead of it just blowing up, it's going to start glowing red hot, and it's going to be useful. The last thing that I am going to talk about with uh, regards to resistance um, is the term impedance. So let me write both of these out. Resistance. Resistance is just a general term that we say. But as electricians, what we're really messing with is impedance. And that the reason that is, is because we deal in AC circuits. We don't deal in DC circuits very often, unless you're doing solar stuff or, you know, um, anything that's like DC motors or in an industrial factory or something like that. So you may use the word if you're working in DC environment. But in AC, we're always talking about impedance. And impedance is actually a combination of two different things. Impedance is... Uh, in, uh, is uh, concerned with inductive reactance. Uh oh, I think my marker's running out. And capacitive reactance. So there's two different elements inside of an AC circuit that was that can slow current down. One is a capacitor. A capacitor works just like a resistor in a resistive circuit would, would work, which is a coil of wire. Um, a, a, a capacitor works by building up charges. So when um, negative electrons hit the negative side of this. There's an, a plate in here, basically, where there's negative electrons that build up and positive electrons that build up, and there's just an air gap in between them. Um, so there's no wire connected in between those. So when negative electrons hit the negative plate, they, uh, they repel each other, because like charges repel each other in an electric circuit. So because they repel each other, but current is still flowing, it actually slows down and kind of disrupts the circuit. So uh, that is not a resistance. It's not actually a physical like obstacle that has to be traversed. It's more of a byproduct of something being introduced into the circuit. So it actually makes the waveforms of the voltage and the amperage uh, go 90 degrees out of phase with each other. 
The other thing that also does that is an inductor. So this is where we would get inductive reactants. This was capacitive reactants. Inductive reactants, same thing. When you send current through a coil, the voltage waveform continues going, but the amperage waveform goes out of phase by 90 degrees. So it's slowing the current down, and it starts lagging behind the voltage that's being applied to it. So it's another just kind of weird byproduct phenomenon that happens in an AC circuit because we don't have a constant current that's going through a circuit in a loop like we do in DC. So the current acts a little bit different in AC circuits than it does DC. It's a lot of the same phenomenon. It's just that we have an alternating situation. So even these devices work slightly differently in an AC circuit. So anyways, impedance is what we use in AC circuits because in an AC circuit, these are what you have as your resistance. We just don't call it that. It's more like reactants. But in a DC circuit, you don't have these same phenomena that happen because you don't have an alternating waveform that's switching back and forth and back and forth. You just have a constant trickle of current that's trying to go through something, so we call that resistance. I'm actually going to do a video. Uh, I might do a video on each one individually because there's enough to talk about with each one individually, or I may just do like a combined episode, but I'm going to do another one of these later. I'm also going to do a video on Ohm's Law um, where I can talk a little bit more in depth about doing calculations and how to use Ohm's Law, as well as the power wheel. we got to incorporate wattage in, uh, which my next episode is actually going to be wattage. I'm going to start talking about power because the four, the four terms that we're going to use most as electricians are voltage, amps, ohms, and uh, wattage, or uh, what we call KVA or VA, uh, volt amps. Wattage and volt amps are a very similar thing. I'll get into that in the next video, but I just want to let you guys know that that's coming up. Um, beyond that, dudes, I just, thank you so much for giving a shit about this channel. Thank you for watching. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for, like, keeping up with all the episodes and commenting and emailing me and fucking just the support in general, man. Uh, this channel's growing, and I really, really, really appreciate that. So um, thank you guys for those of you that are bold enough to give me suggestions for episodes. I want that. I want the feedback. Um, I, You may not see the episode that you asked to do very quickly because I'm only able to pump like one of these a week out, but I do have a notebook that I keep with me everywhere that I go and every time somebody's like hey man make a video about bending pipe you know like I write that shit down somebody's like make a video about what it's like to be an electrician I'll do that on the journey to master video because again electrician you use just theory and how this shit all works and how to be an electrician journey master is more like what the trade's all about and just trade talk pretty much um, so anyways keep the ideas coming I really really appreciate your guys' contribution to the channel and just uh Fucking, you, you matter. Your opinions matter. Um, so thank you. I love you guys, and I will see you in the next episode.